Today we're going to listen to Edwin Listozek from our group at Rice Research Institutes of Sweden. He's going to talk about promises and challenges of federated learning. So Edwin, without further ado, I think you can now take the screen. Yes. So thank you, Olof, for the introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is Edwin Listosek, and I work as a machine learning researcher in the deep learning uh, research group in Gothenburg at RISE. Uh, today, I will be talking about federated learning, promises and challenges. In this talk, I will give an introduction to what federated learning is, uh, what type of problems we can solve with it, and what challenges uh, we are still researching within the field. So we live in a time where data is still increasing a lot every year and has been doing that for many years. Uh, we have phones and tablets that are the primary computing devices for many people around the globe. These devices uh, carry with them strong sensors uh, like cameras, microphones, and GPS. They are also frequently carried by their users. You have probably your phone with you right now. So they access a huge amount of data that is private to you. Models that we learn uh, on this data have the potential of greatly improving our usability and our utility. However, this data is very sensitive, right? Uh, they have access to your location data, to your uh, photos that are being sent up to the cloud. Um, so there are, of course, risks and responsibility to storing it centralized. For example, GDPR was a new law in the European Union a few years ago, 2018, I believe, that partly addresses this problem. Uh, but this, it's in this setting that uh, federated learning is, um, is uh, brought up. So federated learning was introduced by Google in 2016. Uh, they coined the term uh, in the paper, communication efficient learning of deep networks from decentralized data. Uh, in their paper by McMahon et al. It was also later published at AI Stats 2017. In this framework, you have models uh, that are shared, a global model that is shared, uh, and data that is decentralized. Uh, so in this framework, uh, a central server orchestrates the learning between many clients, and each client has their own private data set. Uh, and the data sets are not shared. Uh, so it starts with that the uh, server initializes a global model that then is sent out to every client. And then uh, each client uh, optimizes that model on its local data set. After that is done, every client sends back their models to the central server, which then averages uh, these models and updates the global model. That uh, is one iteration, one communication round. And then this is iterated for many times until we have reached an acceptable uh, global model. By the way, if you have any questions during this talk, don't hesitate to ask uh, uh, during the talk. Uh, so federated learning is becoming increasingly more popular since 2016 when Google's first paper came out. Uh, as you see in the bottom right plot, uh, I've shown you here the Google search trend for federated learning across the globe. And we see a clear spike in interest after 2016 when the paper is released. And it's only continued upwards since then. And cross-device federated learning and federated data analysis are now being applied in consumer digital products. Google were, of course, the pioneers in this sense, uh, and, they makes, uh, and they make extensive use of federated learning in uh, the Google um, Gboard mobile keyboard, predict, predicting the next word. Uh, then also in their Pixel phones and in Android messages, federated learning is being used. Apple is using federated learning in iOS 13 for QuickType keyboard and also in their voice assistant Siri. Doc AI is developing federated learning solutions for medical research and SNPs, which I think is owned by Sonos, has explored federated learning for hot word detection. Federated learning is not only used uh, cross device, but also cross silo. 
uh, many applications have been proposed in cross silo settings. Uh, for example, for finance risk prediction, uh, for reinsurance, pharmaceuticals discovery, electronic health records mining, medical data segmentation, and smart manufacturing. You can imagine that this is important for example, hospitals, uh, if you want to deploy some type of um, model for any, um, any health data, uh, that's very sensitive data and you don't want to, you maybe not want to share that data between hospitals due to that uh, safety concern, then it would be interesting to research federated learning models that can uh, learn models on decentralized data and then aggregating those models in a central place without storing all that sensitive data in one central place. So mathematically, we can uh, formulate the federated optimization with this, uh, with this loss function here. So W is the weight of the global model that we want to learn. And we do this by minimizing the loss function you see on the right hand side here. And that is basically a sum over all the clients participating in the federation. So K here is the client index. And we calculate the expectation of the loss function uh, for each client based on the data distribution for each client. And then we basically just uh, take an average of this. Uh, and want, and that, so this is what we want to optimize. And in the McMahon paper from 2016, they introduced a, an algorithm called federated averaging to perform this uh, optimization. So in federated averaging, you select a C fraction of clients every communication round. They do this for, so you don't choose all, you don't necessarily need to choose all the clients to participate in every uh, round uh, due to efficiency reasons. You can choose a C fraction and they have shown that it can work for even low values of C fractions. So those clients that uh, participate in each round of uh, each uh, communication round computes a gradient on its local data. And we denote that by, by GK here. And then we take a gradient step or a step in the gradient direction uh, locally on every client based on that client's uh, gradient, uh, based on the local data. On that client. Edwin, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. So, so you're assuming here already when you begin that there is one model that has already been distributed to all the clients. They are yes, exactly. Great. So the central server sends out a uh, a client or a model to every client in the first uh, in the first uh, in the beginning of everything. Uh, so in the figure up to the right, you see how we, we start by initializing weights to some model, uh, to some global model, and then that global model is sent out to every client. So they all start with the same global model in the beginning, and then they train, um, then they optimize for their own local data sets. When that is done, uh, the global model um, is updated by taking an average of all these models a weighted average, which is the last equation on this page, which you see here. Uh, and we that's a weighted average dependent on how many data points each uh, client has in its training set. Uh, so that's just a naive average of weights. And then uh, at next round, we send out the new global model, which was attained by this aggregation to every client and the procedure is uh, updated. And then you do this for as many communication rounds as you need until some uh, criterion is uh, fulfilled, stopping criterion. Uh, so that is the federated averaging. And this is the... Um, so excuse me, uh, so, so the, once yeah. you compute your, your local model, you send it to the global, to the global coordinator, right? Yes, yes, to the central. And then you take the average there of all of these models, depending on the weight, and then you send back the new mm -hmm. updated model to every client. That's correct? Yes. Yes. So, well, and then well, you, you, don't, the you, you don't send back the model. You just send back the, the updates, the gradient updates. Yeah, which is this. OK, fine. It's, it's fine. Yeah, I agree. It's the, they, they show in the paper that it's equivalent to send the gradients and send the weights. So it doesn't matter if you send the weights or the gradients. Yeah, they are equivalent in a sense. Hmm? 
yeah. because because it means if you send the if you send the gradient you should you should update the original model before you do the training <laughs> so until you get the the new model anyway so mm, that's yeah it. okay mm -hmm. thank you and maybe a quick so, question here yeah but is it is there some properties you are preserving here you guarantee that this is correct or i mean when you show an algorithm what is the correctness now Criteria of what do you mean with correctness? I mean, it. This is supposed to compute the same model as if. No, no, it's not the same model, <laughs> as as if it was centralized. No, it is not. Mm -mm. No, it's not. We are optimizing no. for a different uh, loss. Yeah, exactly. Function, right? uh, because you have different data sets. Really... Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we're optimizing for Training. an mm -hmm. average here, basically, which is the data of all clients. So we want one global model. Which is optimized for uh, all clients. Okay, so my question was basically then, what is the relationship between that model and if everything was done on the centralized server? Hmm? Mm, that's an interesting question, um, and they do some experiments in uh, in the. Because that's paper what you want to really know, many, right? Mm. That they do some experiments where they try to check for how many communication rooms do you need to do this for different data sets to reach the level of accuracy as if everything was trained centrally. Okay, so that is, but there is no like say mathematical proof that you can, you can, for example. Well, they, they have some convergence analysis that- Exactly, that's what converge. I meant. Huh? Yeah, it converge yeah, yeah. to the so model, they, to, the, to the centralized model. After uh, I'm not sure if, you will converge to the centralized model, but you will converge. They have some convergence proofs in the paper. I do not have details of that right now, though. I see. But this is really the, the mathematical part or the logical part of the... Yes. Mm. Could, Thank could you, for the you Yeah, so I had a comment. So could you yeah. argue that more uh, clients in this case is equivalent to a larger batch size? Uh, more clients is equivalent to larger batch size. Well, I'm not sure. How do you how do you think? Because because this looks like as if you are doing stochastic gradient descent, where you are basically taking batches. Yeah, not yeah. Well, mm. It's it's they, they actually discuss this in the paper how how similar this is to stochastic gradient descent. Exactly. However, what what makes this different is that you can do this local update for many local epochs and that makes it different from stochastic gradients then because you can do many updates locally before sending the gradient or weights to the central server for aggregation hmm? but this uh, this uh, will give us um, a natural next follow-up question like for general non-convex objectives you would would the averaging models in parameter space even make sense? Or wouldn't this just produce an arbitrarily bad model? Why does taking an average uh, work even? Mm. Uh, and the answer to this question is yes and no. And they discussed this in the paper by um, with these two plots. Note that the y-axis scale on these plots are different. Uh, but on the x-axis here, we have uh, a mixing weight theta. And we have two models here, W and W prime, and we are mixing them uh, uh, by the mixing weight theta, which is in you know, the x-axis. So a theta of zero means we only have uh, the model W, and a theta of, of uh, one means we only have W prime. And uh, what you see here is then when we do independent initialization of W and W, uh, w prime, uh, mixing them actually gives us a worse uh, model than both of them independently. However, if we do initialize them in the same way, we use the same random seed uh, as common initialization, mixing them will give us a better uh, model. So this um, suggests that models need to be close to each other in some sense in the parameter space in order for this averaging to work. Let's see. Uh, and also, also worth noting is that the paper discusses that if we train too long locally for many local epochs, uh, models will um, end up or may end up in different local optima. 
uh, far away from each other in the parameter space. Uh, and thus, um, if you train too long on, on local data, averaging won't work either. So there's a trade-off between how long you should, uh, how long you should train locally. So may I ask that one more question, simple. please? It's yes. If, but what happened if the data you train on the different clients have different statistical distribution? That's a very good question. And that brings me to challenges with federated learning. Mm. Uh, because what you're talking about here is heterogeneous client data, which is one of the problems we have. And that's far from um, solved. It's an open problem, actually. I see. Uh, I'm, I'm not in the area. Usually I'm these, <laughs> yeah. So usually <laughs> these are the four, four types of problems that you study in federated learning. There are many. Uh, I, I see. We have it here. Uh, communication costs is one of them uh, because wireless communication can be unstable and you have limited bandwidth. Uh, and then we have heterogeneous client data when you basically have non-IID distributions between the client. And you can also have heterogeneous systems, uh, variability in hardware, network connectivity, uh, devices can drop out during training. Uh, and then also you have the privacy aspect. Uh, communicating gradients is not completely private. Uh, even though data never leaves the uh, clients, the uh, papers have shown that uh, you can backdoor federated learning by uh, using gradients. Uh, so a lot of differential privacy is being studied in the setting of federated learning. But so for the next- question, uh, Yeah? Question on that. Uh, so if you use differential privacy on the gradients, does it, uh, can you guarantee privacy with that? Well, you can guarantee epsilon uh, differential privacy, privacy, basically. So they are. That's, they pretty, are that's, papers, that's uh, a pretty strong guarantee. Yeah, they have they have uh, mathematical proofs for that. I think in a follow up paper where they do differential private federated learning, both by clipping gradients and by um, uh, inducing noise to the gradients uh, before averaging. But that's a topic for another time. Today, we will talk more about the uh, heterogeneous client data and non-IID distributions. Uh, and non-identical client distributions uh, can, or client distributions can be non-identical in different ways. One way of uh, uh, being different is feature distribution skew uh, or covariate shift, which means that the marginal distributions uh, P uh, of X between the clients uh, vary even if the conditional distribution P of X given Y is the same. For example, in a handwriting recognition domain, users who write the same words might still have different uh, strokes or different handwriting, right? Uh, so that's one example of that. Another example is uh, you could have label distribution screw, SQ, um, also called prior probability shift, where the marginal distribution uh, P of Y may vary across clients, even if the conditional P of X given Y is the same. An example of this is when clients are uh, tied to a particular geo region or distribution of labels, um, distribution of labels vary across clients. For example, kangaroos only exist in Australia or a person's face is only uh, in few locations worldwide. You could also have uh, a skewness uh, called concept shift where same, you have the same labels but different features. So this means that the conditional distributions P of X given Y may vary across clients, even if P of Y is the same. Uh, so the label Y could have different features X for different clients due to, for example, cultural differences, weather or other things. Uh, for example, images of homes can vary dramatically around the world. Uh, and so can uh, items of clothing. Uh, another type of concept shift is if you have the same features but different labels. Uh, for example, the conditional distributions P of Y given X may vary across clients, even if P of X is the same. Um, because of personal preferences, the same feature vectors in training data uh, can have different labels. For example, labels that reflect sentiment or next word predictors have personal and regional variation. And then lastly, you can also have quantity skew where different clients can hold vastly different amounts of data. Um, and then of course, all of these uh, skewness 
says that I have mentioned can apply at the same time, making this problem very complicated to solve. And you can imagine why this is still an open problem. Um, so in uh, the paper from Google, uh, they do discuss heterogeneous client data and they do some experiment on MNIST. So what you see to the left here is uh, uh, different federated learning uh, models being applied to an IID version of MNIST. So the regular MNIST, but the clients have an IID um, distribution of labels. So the same distribution of labels in every client. On the right plot, you see a pathological non-IID distribution where they sample only two labels per client. And what you see uh, in the legend on both plots is different hyperparameters for federated learning. B here stands for the local batch size and E stands for the number of uh, local epochs that you run during federated learning. And then on the x-axis, you have the number of global communication, communication runs that you do. You see that both models, uh, or in both settings, you do achieve high accuracy. However, that in the non-IID case, uh, convergence is slower. However, this is on MNIST, and that's a very easy problem that is uh, solved by this point in time already. Uh, however, what this illustrates is that uh, non-IIDness is um, slowing down convergence. Um, another paper uh, called Federated Learning with Non-IID Data by Zhao et al. Uh, discuss heterogeneous client data as well. Uh, and they do both experiments on MNIST and on CIFAR-10. So on the left plot here, you see MNIST, and on the right hand side, you see CIFAR-10. In the legends, you see uh, different hyperparameters. B stands for uh, local batch size and E for number of local epochs. And then they do both stochastic gradient descent, which is the blue line. They do uh, IID version of federated learning, uh, which is the green line. And then they do non-IID in two different ways. Uh, the non-IID parenthesis two means that you only have two labels in every client and for both MNIST and cypher and one means you only have one label uh, in each client. And you can see here that the red lines, which is only having one uh, label for both cypher and MNIST, uh, uh, achieves much worse uh, test accuracy than the other ones. And, that, and the same can be seen when comparing the orange one, which is two labels compared to the stochastic gradient descent and IID case. So it's clear that non-IIDness uh, is slowing convergence and also not, uh, you're not able to achieve the same test accuracy when you have heterogeneous client data. Can and I ask a question? Paper, Sorry. Yeah. Hello, Edwin. This is Sagarin. So uh, uh, just uh, the comparison when they do SGD versus federated learning, do they have 10 clients or something like that? What's the reason for this? Um, uh, uh, what do you mean? No, I think the difference in batch size. Clients? Oh, right. I'm not actually sure. I don't remember uh, why. But yeah, you can see that the batch size here is 10,000. Uh, so that it might be that they have 10 clients, actually, just to make a fair comparison. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Uh, so the way they try to solve this in this paper uh, is that they uh, explore transfer learning for personalization. Uh, after, uh, so they run federated averaging uh, after they train a global model centrally on some shared proxy data. So basically they store a fraction uh, or they store some data centrally that is shared among all clients. So they go away from the decentralized version, making it not completely decentralized. However, their experiments show that accuracy can be increased by around 30% for Cypher 10 with only 5% globally shared data. So what they do is that at the initialization stage of federated averaging, uh, they do a warm up uh, training on that data set G, which is centrally stored. And then they send out that model that is, uh, that's the transfer learning. They send out that model uh, to all clients together with a random alpha portion of the centrally stored data set to every client. 
And that's of course expensive. So they send data as well out to every client. Uh, then the local model of each client is trained on the shared data from G together with the data from each client. And the shared data here is IID in their, in their experiments. So they do a lot of, uh, a lot of assumptions here, uh, basically. However, in a recent paper that uh, me and my colleagues have um, uh, put up on archive, we are um, investigating this exact problem as well. How can we solve the non-IIDness of federated learning? And we uh, propose a new method based on a mixture of experts that try to uh, solve the personalization problem of uh, federated learning when data is uh, highly non-IID. So in this paper, uh, our idea is that you have a global model, which is trained uh, using federated learning in the regular sense, optimized with federated averaging. But you also have a specialist model on every client, uh, a local model that is trained only on the client's local data. That is never, uh, that's never leaving the client. And then you also have a gating function here um, in the green part of each client, which, uh, task is to given an input weight uh, the or weigh the global model and the local model uh, dependent on the input so our prediction will be a combination of the global and local model so we can leverage the specialist nature of the local model and the generalist nature of the global model we also um, let clients opt out from uh, training during federated learning so if you don't want your data to be or your gradients to be shared with the central server uh, you can opt out from training but still get the global model uh, and we do experiments to check of how robust our model is to high uh, fractions of op opt out clients so mixture of experts was something proposed in the 90s by by jacobs jordan nolan and hinton so basically you have uh, K expert networks that together um, with a gating function solve the task. So the, the gating function is, or the gating network is also a neural network in this case, and gets the same input as the expert networks. And the purpose of the gating network is to weigh, weigh the different experts dependent on the input. So this is the um, inspiration we use in our paper. So we denote uh, the global model by FG, the K local models by FLK, where K spans over the different, uh, K is the index for client, and HK is the gating function. So what we want to optimize in our paper is uh, this prediction Y hat uh, K here, or Y hat H for every K, which is basically a combination. So that you take uh, the gating function times the, the local model plus one minus the gating function times the global model. So the, the output of the gating function will be a value between zero and one that weighs how much you should weight the different uh, experts dependent on the input X. So step one then is that we train uh, a global model using, using federated averaging. And this is the same uh, this is the same uh, loss function, which I showed you in the first slide of this talk. Uh, so we optimize a global model over all clients and we denote that by w, WG. Um, step two is that we train uh, local models uh, on each client and that's just a regular uh, optimization problem where we take the expectation of the data set on that local client and we do this for every client. So this is completely private, no gradient or data is leaving the, the client. We just optimize a, a model on the client's own data for every client. And then, when, then we have a local model and we have a global model. So what we do in step three is that we train the local mixtures. So this uh, equation six up here is the one I showed you on one of the previous slides, which is just the prediction from the mixture, and that's what we want to optimize. And we do that in the same sense we did with the a local model on the local client's own data. So here we optimize 
the expectation for the loss function locally on every local client data set, but we optimize WL and WG together with WH. Uh, so this will be the final model that we use, which is uh, these three weights we have here. Uh, so we did some experiments to see how uh, this held up and we did experiments on Cypher 10, uh, Cypher 100 and Fashion and Mist. Uh, we sampled the data sets in such a way that every client data set contains two majority classes which together form P percent of the client data and the remaining classes form one minus P percent of the client data. Uh, this is an extreme way of partitioning the data. Uh, because we, for example, in Cypher 10, where we have 10 labels, uh, we only use five clients. So when we have P equals 100%, this me means that um, we will partition the data or labels in such a way that there is no overlap between labels, uh, between clients. Um, so, so that's uh, an extreme, extreme setting, highly non-ID. Uh, further, some users can opt out not participating in the federation, keeping their data completely private. So here are some results on Cypher 100. Here we had 50 clients because 100 divided by two is 50, and we don't want to, we don't want to um, uh, have overlap between uh, client distributions when uh, we have we don't want to have an overlap between majority class classes between clients. So on the x-axis on the right side, uh, you see the majority class fraction. On the y-axis, you see validation accuracy. And the validation accuracy is a mean over all clients. Uh, so 0 0.2 here means that 20% uh, of uh, labels or two labels form 20% of the data and 0 0.1 means two labels is 100% uh, of the data for each client without overlap. And we see here that consistently we are beating the baselines and the baselines are in um, green, the federated averaging, orange is a locally trained model and the red is a fine tuned model uh, from federated averaging. Basically we take the global model that federated averaging gives us and we fine tune it to every local client's data set. And the blue one is our mixture then. And we can see here that for every, every majority class fraction, we are beating the, uh, the baselines or performing at least as good. You see here at 0 0.7, we get approximately the same uh, validation accuracy. We see similar results on Cypher 10. So now you see the same plots on the right side, but for different opt-out factors. Uh, so our opt-out factor of zero means that all clients are participating in the federation. Opt-out factor of 0 0.5 means that only 50% of the clients are participating. And an opt-out factor of 0 0.9 means that only 90% or only 10% are participating, 90% are opting out. And of course, what happens here is that by, op by having a large opt-out fraction, this will um, decrease the performance of federated averaging because federated averaging will get to see much less data points basically. And as a consequence, the fine tune model will perform worse as well, which we see here in the Q equals 0 0.9 case, the um, fine tuned is performing worse than it does in the Q equals zero case because federated averaging, because it's a fine tune from federated averaging. Uh, however, the local baseline is not affected because it's independent of the federation. But you see also that our mixture uh, is not decreasing as much in performance as the fine-tuned model. And this is because it is it leverages both the local models um, knowledge and the federations uh, or the federated average models um, uh, knowledge. So we have a robust uh, solution to this problem. And finally, uh, we, can, we did some experiments looking at uh, how training, uh, train set size is affecting uh, performance. So what you see in this heat map is the majority class fra fraction on the y-axis and train set size on the x-axis. And then the values in the heat map is the difference 
between valid the difference in validation accuracy between uh, our proposed mixture and the fine-tuned baseline. And we see a clear trend here that when train set size increases for both Cypher 10 and Fashion MNIST, um, uh, our model uh, becomes stronger relative to the fine-tuned baseline uh, for all majority class fractions. And with that, I think that was everything I had. So finally, I want to say that if you are a student listening to this talk, we have a master thesis proposal uh, related to federated learning on decentralized federated learning. Basically, we want to investigate peer-to-peer -peer federated learning without a central server. And that was everything from me. Thank you. Do I have any questions in the audience? Thank you, Edwin. Uh, I, have, I have a question which is, uh, which is more of a comment on the last slide. Uh, Yes. Where you <laughs> on this slide exactly? So also for for very small train set size, uh, where the data is skewed. So with a mm -hmm. large majority class fraction, that's also where <coughs> where the proposed model here uh, shines. Uh, so mm -hmm. not not only with larger size, but but also and, and this is extremely small train set sizes. These are train sets yeah. which are five data points. Those are the smallest sets here and 500 yeah. data are the, are the largest ones. That's a very good point. So these are extreme settings. And so Edwin, you, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, there are uh, various ways in which you can have non heterogeneity. You have COVID shift, you yeah. have uh, whatever, whatever, I don't remember what you call them, but yeah. there can be different ways. Now, I mean, this yeah. particular model that you train, is it going to address any one of them in particular or Really yeah, so we are work. investigating uh, when the labels are are he, uh, heterogeneous, right? So when you have a high skewness in the label distributions, that's the problem we are tackling in this paper. Maybe a, a similar question here: that how how do you see the application for this kind of uh, federated setting, like in real life? Well, real life data is seldom uh, IID. It's uh, on the upside, highly non-IID. And that's why research in this area is important because the way you use your phone is probably unique to you and not in a way um, similar to any other person. So we want, not, so probably a, an average model that is optimized for all clients is not the best model for you, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm thinking more like, you know, for instance, in, in a setting where I'm not contributing to like the central model, um, why would like, you know, the central model let me use its model? To, well, for any reason? Well, think, well, think of um, any company like Google, for example, uh, people may want to use their product uh, but they don't want to disclose their data or their information about themselves. So they choose to opt out from uh, from Federation. However, Google still wants to give a good product, right? So they will give, still give you the the uh, the overall model that is trained on everyone else's uh, gradients. Okay. Uh, and so that so so of course, if no one uh, opts in, then this won't work. So this relies on that at least there's a critical mass which wants to be, that wants to be part of the Federation. Um, part of the paper is also, is also introducing the, the, the possibility of splitting the data so that you have a fraction of your data to opt in and fraction to opt out. And that could be enforced with, from, from some controller. Exactly, so you could, you could Imagine a scenario where you have some data which is sensitive and some data which is not, and then you could uh, disclose the data that is not sensitive. Yeah, it doesn't Interesting. have to be binary. Hmm? And I'm thinking, like, you know, I mean, this also has a kind of a security um, aspect there, like, you know, if, if I want to poison, like, you know, the, the, the model, like. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, for example, if you are the prime minister of Sweden, maybe you don't want to disclose your data, but if you're just uh, an average Joe like me, then you can send all the data you want because it's not sensitive. Yeah. In sense. So if I understand this correctly, then you don't assume that you have the same features. So 
the the secret model could have different features than the public one, right? I'm not sure I followed the question. Could you elaborate so you, a bit? So you can have a set of input features that are more sensitive that you can use for your own local trading. And you can have another set that you're willing to share. Yeah, or, a date, or basically you could have a part of your data which you find sensitive and another part of your data, or like in your data set, you have some training examples that are sensitive and you, you leave those out. But those, that, yeah. those training data that are not um, uh, sensitive, you include. So dimension. pretty much what I mean is, is splitting it in the other dimension. We're splitting it not not in the data samples, but rather in mm. parts of each sample, if you get what I mean. You can have, uh, let's say your, your height is, is not so sensitive, you can share that, but you don't want to share your personal number or something. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that could also be the data split. Yeah, it seems like it would work. Martin, are you talking about feature split then? Feature split? Yeah, yeah exactly. I didn't see that you... The, the model doesn't have to be exactly the same, right? And the architecture of the model doesn't have to be the same either, if I understood correctly. No, but the, the, the models that take part in the federation needs to solve the same problem. And that's true. But um, they could do it in different ways. It should sort of work on the same feature space. OK. So earlier, you talked about another method for handling non-IID data. Um, uh, uh, uploading data to each individual client. It looked, looked like a really interesting uh, uh, approach. Did, did you compare to that at all? Is it relevant to compare to that? We did not compare with that because it's a bit different setting. Um, uh, or maybe it would be relevant to compare uh, how much the accuracy is going up. But I don't know if it's a fair comparison because we are not training on the same data when you, when in their, in their way they are uh, inducing some type of IID-ness into each client, right? Because you have an IID data set centrally, which you then sample a fraction of and give to each client. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I agree that it's a definitely an interesting solution to the problem. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a fair comparison to what we are doing. Okay, thanks. So somewhat unrelated, questions? yeah, mm -hmm. so some, somewhat unrelated, I was thinking of like the, in principle, the inverse of what we're talking about here, but have you seen any relation between federated learning and things like Leon Boutot's work in terms of course of invariance? So, I mean, in those cases, you really want non-IID data. Uh, <clears throat> So have you seen works where they try to apply this uh, causal invariance approach to to like each individual client as a way to identify bias or spurious That's correlations? An That's an interesting idea. I've never I've never come up with a paper or never stumbled upon a paper that does any type of causal inference together with federated learning. But I. But there are right. there are some areas which which uh, do do domain adaptation of federated learning, and I guess that is similar to what you're talking about as well. Mm, yeah. Can it be something like um, using I mean blockchain kind of a stretcher to track or like have a proof of work or something, and then just thinking now. Uh, was that a question or I didn't? No, so I mean it was like a comment, like mainly like uh, yeah. I'm thinking like if 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 you use like blockchain like um, structure to uh, to track or like you not know, to have kind of proof of work uh, and who is doing what uh, in terms of uh, yeah the contribution or like you know for instance I'm I'm also looking at like you know, I mean maybe like you know more from a security angle like you know, if someone is poisoning or um, yeah, exactly. So the privacy part or being robust to, to adversarial attacks is an important research problem. And there are 
some work going on in the encryption space together with federated learning in order to ensure ensure uh, privacy. However, encryption is very uh, costly, uh, so that uh, a lot of other problems arises then. Yeah, that, that nicely takes us into the topic of next week's seminar. When Richard Bremval is mm -hmm. going to talk about homomorphic encryption. Um, don't miss it. Do we have more questions for Edwin? So maybe you can talk a little bit about the different non-ID uh, problems you discussed in the beginning compared to how you mm -hmm. split this data set. Uh, how we do it in our case, you mean? So you, you split this in, in a very um, uh, difficult way, I would say, mm -hmm. for for the algorithm, right? With this non-overlapping data set. Mm -hmm. So exactly. what do so these what actually have to gain by sharing with each other? In, in these yeah. data sets, it's pictures, so maybe they are sharing colors and, and maybe edges. Yeah, exactly, and so, so if Cypher 10 is uh, pictures, right? So, uh, well, you could uh, argue that being good at identifying objects or classifying objects, even if they are different, would help, uh, help learning. So the, you are not learning so being able to, if you have one day one client which only have dogs and one client which only have cats uh, of course being able to classify dogs won't help the cats but being able to identify that there's something there and there could be other features that are important that are shared between these two tasks right yeah so that leads me to, to assume sort of that even though you looked at that particular problem with the class imbalance this would work for all the other ones as well all the other different problems that you listed. Mm, could you elaborate? So you had a list of different uh, assumptions on how the distributions would change in the beginning, right? The marginal distributions. Uh, you had that uh, yeah, long I mean, argument, yes. but yeah, exactly. Yeah. But basically, we looked at one of these problems. The label. Yeah, we looked at this scale. label distribution scheme exactly. But it doesn't seem like there's any reason to assume it doesn't work for all the other ones, or? Ah, no, no, that's correct. Uh, we have just not performed any experiments there. But it would definitely be interesting future work to tackle more of these problems. So federated learning is a very new technique and still in its infancy research-wise. So a lot of uh, papers are still coming up and a lot of interesting research being, is being made all the time. Um, so a lot of low hanging fruits, so to speak, to catch in these these areas. It's a definitely interesting solution that you had here. It, it's mm -hmm. a quite neat one. Go and grab your copy at archive. <laughs> the archive paper is yet not updated to the latest version, so wait a few days before you do. If that was all, I think we are done then, if there aren't any more questions from the audience. Thank you for a really nice discussion and thank you Edwin for a really nice talk. Thank you all for participating. Thank you.